Joshua Lipton, the artistic and executive director of Mission Opera and now Mission Orchestra. But what's really special is that I'm the director of music here at Santa Fe United Methodist Church. And we are so happy and thrilled that you guys came out on a cool December evening at all the other places you could be on a Saturday night. And you decided to come and hear some lovely uh, John Williams yeah. and Mary Oh, 
greatest film score ever written, John Williams' score for the great cycle of some uh, six or seven films, Star Wars, an incredibly intricate score where each character, each idea, even each object and location have their own little melody that are all interwoven together in a kind of tapestry that movie music hadn't heard in 1977 when the first one came out since like the 1940s. I saw it when it came out. I was in about the fifth grade. And I saw it at the National Theater of Westwood, which was one of those old theaters that had like over a thousand seats, maybe two thousand. And it was also one of the first movies, I think, that uh, used THX Dolby Sound. And when the blast of the main title came up, it was simply overwhelming. Because again, it had been years since anyone had heard a full, symphonic, heroic, sweeping score in a movie before. At that time, they were mainly uh, pop songs, uh, was the uh, fashion band. And it uh, caused an incredible revolution in, in uh, all the film scores that, that have followed. And he's still to this day, the, the scores for Star Wars still use the themes and ideas that started all those years ago. An incredible cycle of symphonic thought as well as uh, science fiction thought for the movie itself. It's funny how uh, great or popular movies or shows of any kind can find their origins in strange places. Something in, uh, as obscure as Joseph Campbell's theories of mythology, which is what uh, George Lucas based Star Wars on. But the Broadway did Les Miserables they found inspiration in an 1862 French novel by Victor Hugo. I can only imagine when the authors took that to producers and said, this will be a hit show, this uh, French novel from 150 years ago. And they probably, I'm surprised they didn't turn it down. It, but uh, they didn't go to Broadway and producers at first. This is actually why I think it did not get turned down. It was first produced in Paris, where they had a much more kind of national pride and feeling in the novels of Victor Hugo. And from then, they scored it up and then translated it to English, and it had its premiere in the West End, which was sort of the Broadway of London, and then finally to the real Broadway, where it was a hit of such magnitude, it is still to this day, I believe, one of the top four or five longest running shows in history. One of the, and I think it's the second longest running show in history of London. Selling sound original uh, cast album. <clears throat> uh, you never know where you're going to find these uh, interesting kind of ideas for hit shows. This uh, wonderful score here, written by a French composer, Schoenberg, uh, has an interesting jazzy inflection, <laughs> which would, one would not expect for something from, uh, you know, uh, romantic 19th century France. But it is enormously effective. Many of the tunes from this show became takeout top 40 hits for various artists. And we'd like to play an excellent arrangement of all of these great tunes for you now from Les Miserables. Or what it is, probably now.
19th century classical music composer and his rivalry with a very obscure Italian composer living in Vienna in the 18th century. How about that as a source for uh, an uh, Academy Award winning Best Picture and one of the top 10 best, uh, most popular big hits of the year it came out? That is what Amadeus turned out to be. And that was a Hollywood movie, a Hollywood produced movie, although uh, filmed in, in, in Europe for the locations. And for its soundtrack, it didn't have any hit tunes. It had classical music, all by, composed by the movie's namesake, Amadeus, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who technically his name was not Amadeus, it was Amade, in the French version. Amadeus, beloved of God, and that was Mozart to be sure. His greatness, they often say, his accomplishment is beyond analysis. We know it's great, we love it. Can we explain why? Not really. Somebody made a PhD a dissertation one time calculating what were most likely the number of waking hours that Mozart had during his lifetime. He only lived to be 33, I think. 36. Yeah, how many waking hours he must have had. And then they put together the amount of music that he wrote, that he had published. He obviously wrote other things that he didn't think turned out well, but he didn't publish. And it simply was a scientific impossibility. They figured out there was no way he could have achieved that unless he never made a mistake and wrote music at, at like the tempo it's performed, <laughs> which isn't possible. And that's including rides in coaches and things where it's too you know, jiggly to be able to write with a quill and uh, ink, ink bottle. We don't know how he wrote as much as he did, let alone of such extraordinarily high quality. One of the great mysteries. In fact, that's a greater mystery than the one that is propounded in the movie, which is how Mozart died. That's a fiction of the movie, actually. He was not poisoned or murdered. He died of a typhus epidemic in Vienna. Time. He was buried at first as a, in a pauper's grave because he had no money for funerals. He was an inveterate gambler. Uh, if the shock of having a 250-year-old classical music composer as the subject of a hit Academy Award-winning movie, it was even more of a shock when they decided to cast obnoxious frat boy from the movie Animal House, Tom Wolfe, <laughs> as Mozart. Yet that was, uh, it was actually a very true characterization of uh, that aspect of the movie. Many, uh, you know, scholars and musicologists and so forth have been asserting for years that Mozart was an incredibly immature and obnoxious, annoying person, person constantly getting in trouble with the law, with the Archbishop of Vienna and of Salzburg, continually annoying everybody, uh, uh, always getting into scrapes, always getting into trouble, and, uh, and a generally obnoxious demeanor uh, this, in fact, you know, hundreds of years before the movie was made, uh, the, the letters, personal correspondence that Mozart left behind him after death were edited by musicologists because they had so much of them. That's the first thing I So, and they were edited at the day after his death, but we still don't know what was in there. Uh, it's lost to the winds of history. He, uh, and also, he was constantly saying bad things about his colleagues. They cut, they cut that out as well. Nevertheless, genius comes in many different forms of human beings. Not all of them enormously like them. This uh, compilation or medley of tunes from the soundtrack uh, for Amadeus uh, shows some of the greatest highlights of, um, that were used on the soundtrack of the movie, which was performed not by Hollywood Orchestra, but by the uh, London Academy of St. Martin's in the fields conducted by Neville Mariner. And, uh, this did not win the Academy Award for Best Score. Uh, as Mozart was an eligible. The movie that did win uh, the Academy Award, and the composer's name is Maurice Schott, a great uh, movie composer of Lawrence of Arabia, Dr. Zimbabwe, and Kenny Wade scores. And when he went up for his acceptance speech, he said, he said his speech was, the second speech said, thank God Mozart was in ineligible. <laughs>
Harry Potter thing before it became a movie. This is one of the world's great publishing phenomenons. Uh, I think there are eight books, is that right? Seven. When the first one came out, it was by a uh, author who had hardly been published before and was not really a professional author. She lived near the poverty line for part of her life and uh, had trouble getting it published because she had no reputation. And it caused an unbelievable sensation and triggered an, an entire uh, renaissance in the whole activity of reading for young people. Uh, eventually, uh, her uh, series of Harry Potter books became, is to this day, the largest selling book series in the history of the world. And her, uh, and she's, uh, J.K. Rollins, is the first billionaire author in history. When they asked her about this on 60 Minutes or something, they said, uh, how does it feel to be the first billionaire author in history? And she said, I'm not a billionaire. I gave several millions to charity. <laughs> she, was, she was a billionaire for an instant when she received the checks, and then, but instantly converted them, uh, a lot of them to charity. Uh, even the, the, uh, a phenomenon like this in publishing has rarely happened in history. Uh, they would uh, distribute the book starting at mid as soon as it was midnight when the uh, book was to be released, and there'd be a line around the corner from bookstores to get them. In the first uh, 24 hours of the second Harry Potter book, I forget what that one's called. Chamber of Secrets. Chamber of Secrets. When that one came out, in the first 24 hours, it sold 11 million copies worldwide in the first 24 hours. An extraordinary track record. And then when it came time to make the movie, movies, everyone in Hollywood tried to grab it. Everyone from Steven Spielberg directing to uh, big studios, and of course John Williams, who uh, composer, undoubtedly the greatest living movie composer of ever and now. Uh, everyone fought over it. Then they realized that it's going to be a continuous series, so they doled out a little bit to everybody. <laughs> and the score for the Harry Potter series is the work of some four different composers, all of whom are combined together in this medley we're going to play called The Complete Harry Potter, which has motives and themes from all the movies. Uh, this uh, is, com is patterned after Star Wars, in that it has themes or melodies identified with certain objects, with certain uh, people, with certain places. Uh, even the owl has its own theme. In fact, the owl theme, uh, technically, became so distinctive and memorable that you can get it as a ringtone on your phone. <laughs> and uh, it pops up all over the place in the, in the general culture. I think that one is John Williams. Uh, uh, so you'll hear a uh, little tidbits, little snatches, sometimes over the eight measures of a, a theme from Harry Potter, all put together in, in approximately ten minutes of different themes from the, uh, one, one of the, the second great series in movie history after Star Wars. Almost as popular and almost as great, and consciously modeled in many respects uh, on Star, Star Wars. Really one of the great phenomena, though, especially, especially when the books came out. The movies, though, equal that in their popularity and in their kind of excited anticipation. So the music from Harry Potter.
Christmas Carol, whose distinctive feature is a rip roar in Hollywood ending that you put the jingle bells, but also uh, distinguished by the fact that in many instances two Christmas carols are played at the same time. Oh. And sometimes all, uh, in quick alternation, the very beginning of this piece has a uh, quick alternation between uh, Joy to the World and Back the Halls. <laughs> Play two beats apart, like they around, you know, like what Road Warriors wrote. Play two beats apart. Extraordinarily creative piece of music. It was an instant hit when it came out in the early 50s and is now played by, honestly, by most orchestras almost, uh, almost every single Christmas since then. It is the ultimate piece of symphonic music for Christmas. It's very fun to play, as much fun to play and to conduct, honestly, as it is to listen to. So let's enjoy a Christmas festival from the Royal Anderson.
concert here tomorrow night at 6 o'clock p.m. called Winter Holidays of the World. Come here music from Christmas, including a sing-along with a, a song.